Mark chapter 9, verses 1 to 23. Hear the word of the Lord. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. And when they had come to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he said to them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And so I ask your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long? Has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to you, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And they went out on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, for they were afraid to ask him. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. Oh, did you get a lot of presents this last Christmas? Do you do one of those Christmas present opening events? You know, on Christmas morning with the gifts under a tree, you gather around, maybe still all in pajamas, distribute the gifts, maybe send a child to go fetch the wrap boxes. And the inevitable question over and over again is, who's it for? Look at the label. It's for mommy or daddy or grandma or junior or a little sissy. Next one, who's it for? Oh, this one's for me. It's important to know what something is for. If you take a gift that doesn't belong to you, you could end up with a piece of clothing that's too small for you or not for your gender. If you eat a spring roll that was for your wife, you could make her very unhappy. If you take something from a store that's not for you, You could be charged with theft and go to jail. In older law here in the USA, maybe it's still in the books in some states, if you get in an affair with a married person, the spouse of that person could sue you 
for a quote, alienation of affection. You took affection that wasn't for you. The narcissistic person thinks everything's for him. Every present, every bit of food, every relationship, all affection. It's about me, the narcissist thinks. I've seen a boy get upset at the presence for another boy or girl. Upset that the gift wasn't for him. How do you think the boy got that way? Because the parent scrambles to comfort the brat with the promise, I saw it myself, I'll get you whatever that other boy got as soon as the party is over. That's horrible parenting. The parent should teach the kid, some things are not for you. What about you? Do you think everything is for you? I hope not. Who is it for? You know, the pandemic has shown that a lot of people don't know what things are for. We close schools and now make the kids wear masks for a disease that hardly ever affects kids. Even teenagers who are getting closer to being adults physically have very little risk from COVID. About a one in a million chance of dying. If they catch it, they have a greater risk. They have more danger from riding in a car than they do from COVID. And it's even lower for smaller children. But if you try to explain that, and I've mostly given up trying, if you try to explain that, assuming that someone will listen, they'll say, but what about the teachers? Schools are not for the teachers. Well, others seem to think their life is for above all, right? The way they respond to the pandemic shows that above all, their life is to be lived for the goal of not dying. They're going to certainly fail. What's your life for? Well, for some, it's about making money. You know, they live for the dollar. But most people figure that doesn't make much sense in, in the long run. They know they'll die and they, the money will do them no good. They might still live, though. They know that, they, but they'll still live day in, day out to make money. But they say now they say they're doing it for their family. They might not even get to enjoy their family much because they're working all the time, but they comfort themselves with the thought that they're providing for their family. In the TV series Breaking Bad, Gus, who's the drug kingpin, right? he's the head of the drug network, he talks Walter White, recruits Walter White, the chemist, into making meth with a moral lesson. How do you talk someone into making meth? You teach him morals. Quote, a man provides... And he does it even when he's not appreciated or respected or even loved. He simply bears up and does it. What's a man to do, Walter? A man provides for his family. So we have people who call themselves Christians, but say they can't go to church. They can't serve the Lord. Not yet anyway, because first they've got to provide for their family. They've got to bear up and do it, even if their family doesn't care. The drug kingpin would agree. What's it for? We see the answer to that here in three parts. First, the son, then the self, and finally, the suffering. What's Jesus for? Well, that's the question that Peter doesn't understand. He's already confessed at the end of chapter 8, because this story just flows from the end of chapter 8. We're kind of jumping back in the middle of it here. But he's just confessed that Jesus is the Christ. That means he's the Messiah. He's the anointed one, empowered by God, to bring God's kingdom, that's God's rule, God's government on earth. What's the kingdom for? Well, like a kid seeing presents under the tree, who thinks it's all for him, he thinks it's, Peter thinks it's, the kingdom's all for him, or at least it's all for us, our people. Maybe for us Jews, or maybe for our disciples of Jesus. It's, he's for our team, our nation. It's going to make us, the kingdom is, it's going to make us glorious and powerful and rich again. And Peter's probably thinking, you know, and I'll personally get some of that too, because I'm Jesus' right-hand man. I'm set. And so Jesus says in chapter 8, verse 34, if you want to be my follower, you're going to have to deny yourself so that not everything is about you. And take up your cross, your own personal instrument of execution, and follow me. Make your life about me, he says. Do that, he says in chapter 8, verse 37, because it doesn't make any sense 
to give up your life. You're going to give it up for something or another. It doesn't make any sense to give up your life, your soul, for anything else. It doesn't make sense to spend your life for money, even if it's money for your family. Or you're just trying to save your life, somehow thinking that you won't die. Then when you inevitably die, what will you have to show for your life? What did you live for? For money? They won't do you any good? For kids who will then follow your example and they too will be living for making money for their kids and on it goes on forever and ever, generation after generation, all just meaningless. Maybe you, you know that, you know all that and you believe in Jesus, sort of, help your unbelief, but you're ashamed. Chapter eight, verse 38, end of chapter eight, you're ashamed to live for Jesus when everyone around you isn't. When, when they measure you by your success at making money for yourself or your family. You're ashamed to be seeking first the kingdom of God when you're in an, uh, what, he, what Jesus calls an adulteress, that is an unfaithful, a self-indulgent and sinful generation. What is your life for? Well, that, Jesus says, that he will show next. He'll demonstrate what is for. And he says that in chapter 9, verse 1. Some standing here among his disciples who will not taste death, they're not going to die until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now, some of these very disciples will see with their own eyes what it's for. So after six days, very unusual to give an exact time lapse showing the connection here that this this is what he was talking about before the story that begins in verse 2 now if you read the bible as just disconnected verses or disconnected stories you lose the connection that is purposely made between here between the promise in verse 1 and the fulfillment beginning in verse 2 and you get caught away by speculations you're asking yourself What's this story for? Is it about our future? Somehow about us? Because we always assume everything is for us? Or is it about AD 70 maybe? Some ancient history that's no longer really relevant to us? What's this promise for in verse 1? Well, it's about Jesus. What's Jesus for? Some think he's about getting your best life now. About making us wealthy or healthy or helping our marriages, just helping us better psychologically adjusted to reality, help us raise good kids who will take care of us when we're old. He's about us. Is that what he's for? Well, here he takes Peter, James, and John. It's his inner core up to a high mountain by themselves. There they could see who Jesus was and what he was for. You'll recognize the Greek word. You all know a little bit of Greek, even if you don't know it. You'll recognize the Greek word used near the end of verse 2. He was metamorphothe. That's the Greek word. Metamorphosized. Or transfigured. Verse 3 describes it. His clothes became radiant, intensely white. white uh, whiter than no one on earth could, could bleach them. What's this for? To show who Jesus is. Jesus has come veiled in flesh. The incarnate deity. But here the veil is pulled back and Peter, James, and John could see the inner nature resplendent, beaming, shining forth to further show his glory. You know, like any glorious man has an entourage, right? Glorious people always have an entourage. And Jesus' entourage appears here. Moses, the lawgiver, and Elijah, the, the leader of the prophets. So you have the law and the prophets which is normally what the Jews called, what we call, the Old Testament. Here in the persons of Moses and Elijah, they're talking with Jesus in verse 4, because the Old Testament is about him. What's the Old Testament for? Jesus. But what's this transfiguration for? Well, Peter thought it must be about us. It's about our kingdom, how we can establish it now. No one will be able to deny it now. I guess he's just assuming Jesus will stay shining like this. Peter didn't know what to say, but he said it anyway. That's the way people often are. They don't know what to say. They'll say it anyway. Let, you know, Rabbi, Master, it's good that we are here. 
Yeah, <laughs> of course it is. It's just running his mouth. Let us make three tents or three tabernacles to be translated. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It's like he wanted to start a building project. You know? Let's start building the headquarters to our new kingdom right now on this mountain. Make this permanent. But no, it's not about let's build something for him. Jesus is already God in human flesh, tabernacling among us. He doesn't need your building project, Peter. And so they are enveloped by a cloud and a voice speaks. It's the father. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Stop talking. Listen. He's not for you to work for. He's not for you to build for. Not to you to try to set up your kingdom on earth with your labor and you conveniently getting to be, you know, up there in the top of this new organization. He's for you to listen to. And suddenly no one was left. Not Moses or Elijah. But Jesus only. What's your life for? Probably not money. You think it's all about family? You know, even if you have to sacrifice your family in order to provide for your family, you'll, you'll do it because you think that's what life is for. Or do you think it's about not dying? And so you're in fear of any threat to it. When it all is done and everything is stripped away and you'll have no money, you'll have no family with you, you won't be able to save your life. Like here, all else will be gone and there will be Jesus only. As they're coming down the mountain, after this mountaintop experience, Jesus instructs them to tell no one about this, not yet, because all this is for after he's raised. They ask him, why do the Bible scholars say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus says, well, they're right. They're absolutely right. We saw in Malachi just two weeks ago that the Old Testament ends with the promise that Elijah will come. Here at the Transfiguration. That happened, that happened literally here. Elijah literally came. Just like Malachi said he would. But Jesus says that's not all how the promise about Malachi is fulfilled. It was fulfilled by John the Baptist. He prophesied, John the Baptist did, prophesied with the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the people to family and to God to restore all things. In verse 12, restore all all things. What's Elijah for? Well, to restore all things. And they think they know exactly what that means. Restore all things. That means we get to go back to the way things were with, with David. It means glory and, and power. Like King David and Solomon, they, like they had being triumphant, being the head, not the tail. Ruling over the Gentiles, not being ruled by them. That's what it's for. That's restore all things, they think. Then oddly, at the second half of verse 12, Jesus asked a jarring question. I just struck when I was reading this this week. Why is that question there at the end of verse 12? He asked, how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Well, Jesus has been using Son of Man to refer to himself and to connect himself with the one like a Son of Man who brings in God's kingdom in Daniel chapter 7, who is worshipped, who is God. Here he connects the Son of Man himself, uh, the divine kingdom bringer, with the servant in Isaiah 53, right? who, who he describes here. He was, was killed, treated with contempt. He was despised and esteemed not. Now, think of this. Realize what's going on here. Look at the flow of the ideas here, verses 11 and 12 and 13. Because they ask him in verse 11 about Elijah. Then in verse 12, Jesus begins to answer their question. Right? So far, it looks very normal. Elijah comes, comes first to restore all things. And then he interjects this question, this odd, jarring question. Why the servant of the Lord, who is now called the Son of Man, is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Why is the Son of Man like that? Like Isaiah 53. And then he goes back to talking about Elijah in verse 13, making plain that John the Baptist fulfilled the promise about Elijah. Why that question, seemingly just unrelated, like it's just stuck in there, 
with no relationship with anything else around it. But it, of course it's not. Why though is it in the middle at the end of verse 12 about him suffering and being rejected? Why is he asking that here? Well, Jesus is trying to break through their assumptions. They think they know what the Messiah is for. He's for glory. He's for triumph. That's what restoring all things means. It means getting back on top again. Just like people today think they know what life is for. Even the drug kingpins know that life is not just about money. It's about family. Here they think they know what restoring all things is for. It's for getting back on top of the world, being the leaders again. But here Elijah, John the Baptist, came, restored all things. Right? Did he do what he was supposed to do? Yes, he restored all things. He turned the hearts of God's people to God and to their families. And yet still, he was killed. Still, the Son of Man, the one who brings in God's kingdom, the Messiah, will suffer and be treated contemptuously. How is it written that that will happen? Because that's what he's for. Well, what are you for? Hopefully not just money or things you can get in a wrap box on Christmas or our birthdays. Maybe you're not so narcissistic as to get upset when someone else gets a gift. You even like seeing other people get gifts. Maybe you like Christmas or even other people's birthdays for the joy of seeing someone else get something they like, especially if you gave it. You're more long range. You, you know that if you win someone's favor by doing favors for them, by giving them gifts they like, they'll be more likely to, to do favors for you one day when you need it. You think if you raise your kids by giving them what they need, they'll respond by being good to you, especially when you're old and decrepit. You know, they won't put you in a nursing home unless they absolutely have to. But it's still all about you, isn't it? It's more long term. You're planning for the long range. Maybe you even think like a lot of people that, that Jesus is about you. You think all of this. What we're here for, Jesus, the Bible, the faith, the prayers, worship, the church. It's all for self. Just last Friday, we were going for a New Year's Eve meal. Listen to K-Love Radio. Heard this song. I know I've heard it many times before, but never paid any attention to its words. And it begins, I keep hearing voices in my head that I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. And in the song, no, those are lies. You're not enough. You'll never measure up. And the, the refrain goes over and over again. I believe, I believe, believe what? In herself, the singer, that I do measure up, that, that I am enough. I, I was thinking, listen to that song. I keep hearing voices in my head that I'm not enough. That voice is probably the Holy Spirit. Actually telling you, you're not enough. Using the word of God, you fall fallen short of God's glory and you sin. And you need to repent. Yeah, that, that's, those are lies. Those are the, the truth. But that's what we're fed today. Sometimes in Christian radio and the songs, you need to believe. Believe in yourself. Well, Jesus comes directly from the Father, declaring that he is, the, that he is my beloved son. To, he comes from that on the mountaintop to dealing with the devil, just like before, after his baptism. Remember the baptism? Same way. This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. And then he goes into the desert to be tempted here. He hears God saying, the mountaintop, my beloved son. And then he goes and deals, has to deal with the devil. He comes from the mountaintop of glory to the valley with Satan and unbelief with people who think life is all about self. Maybe they've been singing that song to themselves all, all day long. The first of those people are his own disciples, those he left behind when he went up to the mountaintop. And while he's on the mountaintop, they're in the valley, they're wrestling with Satan, they're trying to cast out demons. In Mark chapter six, verse seven, when Jesus called the apostles, he gave them authority over evil spirits to cast them out. And so they should be able to cast them out. But here, they can't. Why? Well, Jesus comes down from the mountain to see in the, in the valley. His other disciples, they, they have a crowd around them. That's kind of interesting. 
They have a crowd around them trying to cast out these, de- these demons out of this boy, and they're, they're doing it in front of an audience. Interesting that Jesus, remember, we were before in Mark, almost every time he did some miracle for someone, he would take them away from the crowds, do it in private. Well, here, there's a crowd around the disciples and the, and the scribes, the Bible scholars. They're arguing with them probably about why they can't cast out the demons out of this boy. And when the crowd sees Jesus, they, they run to him. They turn their attention to him. Something amazing about Jesus being there. In verse 15, they're flocking to him. And Jesus asked them, what what's this argument about? What's this debate you've been putting on here? A man speaks up, the father of the boy. He calls Jesus teacher, rabbi. It's a master. It's a term of respect. So he's being very respectful to Jesus. He says in verse 17 that he brought his son to him, to Jesus. And of course, Jesus wasn't there. He was away on the mountaintop. And the man describes the problem in verse 18. The boy has an evil spirit that gives him seizures. And the man asked the disciples to cast this, the spirit out of, out of his son. But they weren't able. Again, why? Why weren't they able when Jesus has already given them authority to do it. Jesus then in verse 19 laments that generation, that, that culture of people, that society. He says that they are faithless. Now this is very much like what he said at the last verse of chapter eight, just before the transfiguration, he described the generation as adulterous and sinful. To be adulterous is to not know what someone is for, not to know what you are for. You're for your spouse, not someone you're not married to. The adulterous person thinks narcissistically, anyone I want is for me. Here in verse 19, the same generation, adulterous, now faithless, basically the same thing. To be faithless is to be unbelieving. To be faithless is, is not to have faith. Faith in who, though? Disciples had some kind of faith. They had enough faith to try to cast the demon out. And when the father asked them to do it, they didn't throw up their hands and say, oh, no way we can do that. What are you, what are you, who do you think we are? No, they, they thought they could do it. They tried to do it. They go, they're not even understanding why they're not able. They tried to because they had faith in something. Maybe they had faith in their authority. Jesus had told them, I've given you authority. Or maybe in their goodwill. We're good people. We're religious. Their religion. Maybe their faith. They had faith in themselves. Is what they had faith in. They just didn't have faith in the right thing. So they were faithless. Like that generation. Like our generation. And so Jesus asked for the boy and they bring him. Notice in verse 20, when the evil spirit saw Jesus and convulsed the boy, he sent him into a seizure. He's rolling around on the ground. He's foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father how long the boy has had these kind of seizures. He says from early childhood. And the, the spirit makes the boy try to throw himself into fires or into water to kill him. But trying to make him commit suicide. And the father pleads pathetically in verse 22. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. It's a faithless generation. The man and the disciples are raised in an atmosphere of unbelief. Now, that's the culture of that and of our generation. But he's desperate and so asks Jesus, if you can do anything, have mercy. And that provokes Jesus' response in verse 23. If you can, if you can, you're not sure that I can do it, and yet you're asking me to do it? That's the faithless generation speaking, questioning if Jesus is able to overcome this evil spirit, to do the miracle, to do anything. And then Jesus says, all things are possible for one who believes. Now, this verse is popular with the prosperity gospel people. That they'll say, if you want something, you're crippled and bound to a bed, or you're poor, you have cancer, you want to be healed, or you want to be made rich then all you have to do is believe, have faith. Don't be part of the faithless generation. All things are possible for one who has faith. But faith in what? Believes in who? You know, faith has to be in something. It has to be focused on someone. What or who? 
Notice how the prosperity preachers, they got to smuggle in their assumption. You know, they don't really explain it. They just sort of assume it. Faith in whatever you want to have faith in. Faith in yourself. You choose to be healthy or wealthy or powerful. And you have faith in what you and your sovereignty choose. And your faith in yourself makes it come to pass. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus has challenged this man. What do you mean if I can? Have faith. Faith in who? Believe not just in anything, not just have a positive mental attitude. You know, be, be more optimistic, fella. Things will get better in 2022. Have faith. Faith in self. You can do it. You just set your mind to it. Have faith in me, Jesus says. What's faith for? Oh, not for ourselves, whatever we want. It's for relying on Jesus. And so immediately the man cries out in verse 24, I believe. And he means, I believe you, Jesus. But help my unbelief. What's faith for? Well, that depends on what it is. Many people think it's, it's something they, they gin up with their willpower. They choose to believe in one thing or another, maybe against all evidence, that faith can get you whatever you want. And we're sold this all the time. And we're, we're told, you can be anything you set your mind on. Really? No, even if you can barely jump and you have really poor coordination, still... You can be an NBA star if you just set your mind to it. Just believe. No, it's like to play the music man. Some of you have seen that. The Mary and the librarian chooses to believe in the music man against all evidence. And that faith transforms him and makes him into the kind of man she wants him to be. People take verse 23 here and make it about self. Faith in self, not the son. And they think they can do anything. But here the man says he has, he has some faith in Jesus. He's just asked Jesus, if you can, that's who his faith is in, as, as partial as it is. It's in Jesus, if you can. And he confesses also to some unbelief. Help my unbelief. In other words, help me believe you more. I need to believe you better. I just believe what I want. I need to believe in you better, pure, stronger. But we've been told that faith is something that we will ourselves to have. You know, that we manufacture it in our minds. We determine to believe in what we want to believe in. And somehow with that, we can make ourselves get anything we want. And so why does he ask here? But if that's true, why here does he ask Jesus for help? For his unbelief. You know, faith is just something that comes from his will, his mind. It depends entirely on him. Then why does he ask Jesus for help for it? But he does. He's actually right. The man is actually perfectly right. Because that's not what faith is for. It's not what faith is and it's not what it's for. It's a gift that comes from God and is focused on God here on Jesus. And so he pleads for help to believe because our faith comes from him. And is about him. It's for him. Help my unbelief. It's a great prayer. In verse 25, the crowds that were around the disciples are now gathering around Jesus. What are miracles for? Over and over again in Mark, Jesus doesn't do miracles just for the publicity. And so now he, he hurries up. He rebukes the spirit. You mute and deaf spirit. I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And like a spoiled child being overpowered, it throws a fit, but it has no choice but to obey. Now, some thought the boy was dead. He's kind of lying stiff on the ground, but Jesus takes him up by the hand. He's restored. And the disciples later ask in verse 28, why couldn't we cast it out? We were asking that of ourselves earlier. Why couldn't they cast it out? And Jesus says in verse 29, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. What's prayer for? Now, many people assume that prayer is like making a wish at a wishing well. You throw in your coin, 
and you wish for what you want. Prayer, they think the same way. You pray and ask for what you want. You don't even have to give a coin. It's for you. It's for self. It's about changing something out there, changing what you want changed in the world, in your life. But did you notice that Jesus doesn't pray? That's odd, isn't it? There's no account of him praying here. Yet he says that it can't come out except by prayer, but he, he didn't pray. The disciples couldn't cast it out because they didn't pray. That's because prayer is supposed to make us depend on God. Prayer is, is for God, not for changing God, for changing us to be more like God, for us focusing on God. God is already focused on God. So Jesus doesn't need to pray. He's already focused on God. We're not. We need to pray to get our eyes off ourselves, to stop believing in ourselves, to come to God with honest humility, spreading out our needs. I need this. I want this. Admitting our dependence on him. Maybe he'll change what we want. Then we can overcome the devil. But if we think it's all about us, everything is all about us, we're actually like the devil. That's why we can't overcome him, because we're like him. Now, if we think Jesus is his authority, his prayer, the Bible, faith, the church, is about us. It's about self, to get what we want. I will get this. So I'm going to use this Bible. I'm going to use faith. I'm going to use whatever to get what I want. I will, I will. Well, well, then we're a lot like Satan. Satan said in Isaiah 14, I will ascend. I will set my throne. I will, I will, I will make myself like the most high. Satan is about self. Are you? What is Jesus for? How many assume, just assume, that he's for them. He's their ticket to the easy life. Wealth, health, popularity, a comfortable, stress-free, trauma-free life. Even if they're not a kind of simplistic quid pro quo prosperity believers who promise that if you give a dollar, you'll get $10 back, you know, that kind. If they're not simplistic like that, they, maybe they have a kind of a general, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of prosperity doctrine that, that he's for you, he's for your comfort, he's for your best life now. That's what Peter thought. That's what all the disciples thought. Jesus is for triumph. He's not for suffering. What sense does it make for a Messiah? You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. What sense does it make for him to be for suffering? And so Jesus teaches them as they're walking through Galilee, the son of man, me, is going to be delivered to the hands of men and they will kill him. They're going through Galilee. This time he's not teaching other people not doing big meetings. He's not praying for other people. He's focusing in on these disciples to get that lesson through to them. And he can't be any plainer. But they're so certain that he's for their ease. He's the Messiah. That's what he exists for. He's for their triumph. They can't believe it. They can't understand it. He's focusing on his disciples. So at least they'll understand out of all this self-indulgent, faithless generation. We just finished with Christmas, which the world loves. And many Christians think Christmas is a great time. The world now has its attention on Jesus. So it's a great time to talk about you get people to talk about him and to focus on him. Well, sort of, maybe. I'm not sure. You know, the world loves Christmas because it's about a baby. It's about comfort and, and joy. It's not about suffering. It's not about nails, spears, piercing him through the cross he bore for me, for you. And Jesus tells them plainly, he will suffer. They will kill me, he says. Then he'll be raised from the dead. But they couldn't understand because their minds are so full of the idea that he, Jesus, the faith, the promises, the, the kingdom of God, the Bible, it's all for self. No suffering. They couldn't hear him. And they were afraid to ask. What's your faith for? Is it for getting 
the stuff, the things, the, the life you want? Is it to avoid suffering? So you, you pray to get what you want. You believe, you think, you believe to get God to act for you, to move him. You give to get more back. You obey God. Not because you love him. Because you want stuff from him. Because you want relief from him. You speak because you want something for yourself. Your kingdom. When you should be listening. What are you for? Are you for providing for yourself? Are you for your family? Well, that's good, isn't it? It's like the drug kingpin said. You're going to provide. You're going to make sure that those kids have the stuff they need. Even if they don't like you or respect you. Because that's what you're for, you think. Is that what you're really for? For a house and cars and clothes and, and education? The Westminster Catechism begins by asking, what are you for? What's your chief end in its terms? What are you for? Well, it's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. What is Jesus for? Is he for giving you what you want? Well, maybe. That depends on what you want. If you just want to be healthy and wealthy and powerful all for yourself, well, no, he's not for that. If you want to be in a relationship with God, if you want to be one of his children, to see his glory, to have him there for you when no one else and nothing else will be, then listen to him. Believe in him. Appeal to him. Beg him. Help my unbelief. And then have faith in him. That he's for you.